All right, so seven-year-old, you're debating a Muslim. <laughs> so how did you start to think about Catholicism? Yeah, well, I mean, at that, at that stage, so I started picking up that something was very different just about me and about the way that I was being raised because faith was just not important to most people, um, most people of my age, you know, and I kind of realized that there was something not quite the same, not, you know, it was just a bit different. And so, um, you know, around, I, I, I continued to grow up in a home where, you know, regular church attendance was just a de facto norm of everyday life. Reading the Bible every day was a de facto norm of everyday life praying with my parents we had grace before meals um you know my dad is his kind of nickname was the god squad you know i mean in the uk in the kind of financial circles that he moved in um because him and his business partner or a couple of his business partners were mm. were all very strong christians um and then i guess by the time that i kind of went to st paul's st paul's is a big secondary school in england um you know, I was pretty, well, I thought I was <laughs> pretty well versed in kind of anti-Catholic, like I can defeat the Catholic church, you know, on all doctrinal points. Um, and, you know, kind of classic arrogance of a 12 year old teenage boy who thinks he knows everything. Um, and there was a priest at St. Paul's. So St. Paul's is an Anglican school, mm -hmm. um, but um, there was a priest there an Anglican priest who would, what I would, what I would describe him as was like high church Anglican, right? Which is kind of Anglo Catholic as it's called in the UK. And Anglo Catholicism is, you know, there's, for example, like he would genuflect when he walked into the church. This was something which was totally, totally opposite to how I grew up. Um, he, you know, the service that he conducted was done investments. Again, something completely opposite to how I, how I grew up. Um, and there's a kind of fun punchline to the story at the end of it, but without ruining the punchline, he, you know, he basically started defending Catholic viewpoints. So I walked into the classroom being like, this is it. You know, I'm good. I know the answers. Um, and I started spouting off about, you know, he, he and I kind of had quite a few classes together. And, and really by the kind of age of 15, I think I was, I was in the thick of trying to defeat him on Catholic theology. Would you um, say at the age of 15 you had a living relationship with Jesus Christ and were trying to abstain from sexual impurity and things like this? Yeah. 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 I mean, wow, what a, what a grace. You know, I mean, like all teenage boys, there's uh, living in a major global city, you know, there's, there's temptations everywhere. Mm. Um, but I definitely had a knowledge of the Lord. You know, I, would, I was engaged in a... Yeah, I mean, I was, I was definitely engaged in a living relationship with God at this point. Um, and, you know, that would, and I was, I was battling with this question of Catholic theology. You know, I was kind of baffled by how he had started defending, for example, like sacramental theology. So, you know, I walked in and basically said, well, the sacraments deny the, the effects of grace, mm -hmm. you know, like to say that you require the sacraments is an obstacle to knowing God. And therefore, right. um, like you can't, you can't be justified by, by, by faith alone if you require the sacraments. Right. And this priest, um, his name is Patrick Orsop. He, you know, I remember vividly having this conversation with him where he, he was just like, well, the sacraments are all about grace. Mm. Like they are actually exactly about grace. This is the whole point. And I didn't really have an answer to this. You know, I didn't, I didn't have an answer to any of these points that he raised because having been raised in a home that was, you know, I would say not, not anti-Catholic, I guess, but it was, I mean, it was anti-Catholic, but it was, it was more just that Catholicism and Catholic teaching wasn't taught. Like, why would it be taught? You mm. know, we were not Catholics, so why would it matter? And, you know, there was a kind of, stereotypical view of Catholics, which was smells and bells and rituals, right? And, and an obsession with Mary. Um, and so the, there had never really been any coherent intellectual debate about Catholic doctrinal points. It had all just been an echo chamber. Um, and as a result, when I walked in to start to try and attack the points that I had been raised in this echo chamber to attack, I had very little to fight back against when 
sound doctrinal arguments were put back to me, right? And this is what he started to do. This is what uh, Father Allsop started to do. And that really kind of, in the same way that people who have profound religious experiences and people who have political conversions often become more zealous than mm. anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, for me, that was the first step. Were in, you processing this with your father at the time? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was asking a lot more questions by this point. Um, so another, like, another very big thing, which I think is, is kind of, is interesting is that, you know, the Protestant, ch my church, St. Helens at the time, basically, you know, it was kind of like, I started asking the question, I was like, well, what happened before the Reformation? Like, do we just do we just believe that nothing happened before mm. the, like what happened to Christianity for the first 1500 years mm -hmm. I was just I was very inquisitive about this mm. and I kind of didn't shut up asking these questions I'm like well, well and then <laughs> what was funny was that there were a couple of um, Christian teachers who like evangelical teachers like those I, th I think I'm gonna get his name wrong but I think there's one called Gary Lennox who um, gave a I remember we went on Christian summer camp every year um, which was for the whole family and um, he gave a, 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 a talk series on the early church or like on the, on, on the first 1500 years. And what was, I was so excited to listen to this series because I was like, wow, this is going to answer the questions that I have about what happened before the reformation. Um, and what was funny was that he started off by saying, you know, like there, I mean, he basically started off by saying there were lots of Christians before the reformation. It's just that you kind of had to, you had to seek them out. You had to kind of look into the, the writings of the bishops. Um, and you, 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 you did find quite a few Christians. And, and as soon as he sort of said that, it kind of triggered in my mind, well, like, hang on a sec. So what are we saying here? Like, and then all these questions, I mean, all the questions that so many Catholics I know have been through themselves when mm. they have asked themselves these questions kind of started coming up. Because then, I, then he was saying that, you know, there were like bishops from 11th century Spain who were talking about the effects of grace and how justification by faith alone was, you know, was, was doctrinally sound and all this kind of, and as soon as he started saying this, I realized that there was, there was a Christian church before it. It wasn't that the, the church had just started in, you know, the, the, the date that Henry VIII decided that he wanted to get divorced from uh, mm -hmm. Anne Boleyn, you know, this was it, uh, Catherine of Aragon, even. um, you know, he wanted to get married to Anne Boleyn, but it was, there was a church which existed before this. Um, and now, of course, when I look back on it, it's, it's kind of funny because that's a question that, like, I, if there's a book called Crossing the Tiber by Stephen Ray, and, you know, Stephen writes in that book, like, the, the fundamental question that he, as a former Baptist, had was, you know, was the early church Catholic and then became Protestant? Yeah. Or was the early church Protestant and then became Catholic? Yeah, like right? that, yeah. And... And that was kind of where I was, you know, that was where my faith was at this point. I was like, well, hang on a sec, like, was the early church Catholic or Protestant? And then for me, that elicited like hundreds more questions. Have you heard of Peter Kreeft's question to his university professor? No, I haven't. You know much about Peter Kreeft? I, I've, I've He's listened terrific. to him on your show. Yeah. yeah, yeah, really worth reading. He just, Jordan Peterson just interviewed him. It was the one time I wish Jordan Peterson would have spoken less. <laughs> just let Peter Kreeft shine. Did you watch that? Do you watch it? So good. So he's, he's in a class with a professor and he says, all right, so uh, he just started learning about the church fathers. And so he says, okay, so you're telling me if I got into a time machine, and he said, I still remember the way the professor looked at me, like he used some kind of sci-fi nut. If I got into a time machine and went all the way back, I would feel more comfortable as a Christian in the first, second, third century than a yeah. Catholic would. And the professor said, exactly. And he thought, okay, good. So now all I got to do is go back and read what these early Christians yeah. taught, and I'll convince myself that they were all Calvinists. And yeah. you know the rest of the story. He's a Catholic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching that clip. Before you go, do us a favor, click like, click subscribe, and if this really meant something to you, help us out by sharing it.